Remember on 9-11 when the, the first tower was struck? Um, I was at uh, Joe Sisk's house. He's not here this morning, but he and I go, go way back. And I remember waking up, uh, uh, his roommates, one of his roommates woke us up and uh, he said, oh, a tower in New York, the one of the Twin Towers has been struck. And I remember the thoughts that went through my mind, I was like, wow, what a tragic accident. What, what happened, you know? And then, obviously, a little while later, another plane suddenly strikes the second tower. And I think collectively, probably as a nation, in that moment, a sudden realization that this isn't an accident. Uh, there's people that are behind this. And I think also, I mean, for me, it wasn't just a, a realization that there were people behind this. It, I realized, too, in that moment that this wasn't just a, uh, a couple of you know, crazy individuals that just wanted to wreak some havoc. There was, uh, this was an organized thing. There was, there was an organization or a nation or something behind this action. We saw it as an act of, of uh, terrorism. And, of course, a few days later, the monsters came out of the closet, and that indeed was the truth, right? Uh, it was an act of terrorism, and there was an organization that was behind it. Um, this morning, uh, the theme of the message, I want to propose that monsters are very real. And um, Revelation 13 speaks of them. It speaks about two beasts. And, uh, and there's a dark power that stands behind those beasts. And so we're going to unravel that a little bit this morning. And uh, in the end, we'll end up looking at uh, how to avoid them leaving their mark on us. So uh, let's dig in. We're in Ro uh, Revelation, rather, uh, chapter 13. Going to back up just for a little bit of context. A good divide at, at, at uh, Revelation chapter 12. So we don't have to go all the way back to Revelation chapter 1. Um, John's vision shifts in, in Revelation chapter 12, and uh, he sees a, 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 a vision of a, a woman, um, which last week, and I'll interpret all this as I, as I do summary from last week, that, that woman was believing Israel. It was the people of, of, of God, um, in particular, believing Israel. And uh, this woman was, was giving birth to a, a male son which was, was the Messiah. It was Jesus Christ. And there's this dragon that appears on the scene, and this, this dragon lies waiting to devour uh, this boy, this Jesus. And this dragon we saw was Satan. It was the enemy. And uh, the boy is, is suddenly caught up into heaven as king, and the dragon is suddenly defeated. And now the dragon is, is angry. He's mad. Remember we talked about like an ant pile being stepped on and the ants just go crazy. They go, they go nuts. And so the dragon, although he's defeated, he's now angry and he goes after the woman. But the woman is uh, preserved by God. And we see this with uh, um, after the ascension of Christ when uh, the apostles go to establish the church and to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and His re uh, resurrection as Messiah we see that they are preserved by God. And one of the interesting things about all of the apostles outside of John that we know of, they all died a martyr's death. They all died for their faith. So this preservation isn't a protection from, from uh, physical ailment and suffering and even death. It's a preservation that's much greater than that. They're, they're marked out by God as belonging to Him. They have eternal life. And so this woman, this believing Israel is preserved and so the dragon goes after the rest of her offspring. And we saw that the rest of her offspring represented the church. And that stretches from the time of the apostles to uh, October 2019 uh, here today, uh, the church. And the dragon still goes around. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's still a very angry uh, dragon, but very much a defeated dragon, and that was the theme of last week, right? And so now we hop into uh, to chapter 13. We transition into 13, and so let's, let's read uh, here. We'll look at verses 1 through 4 first. John says, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, with ten horns and seven heads, 
with ten diadems on its horns and, a bla- and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a, a bear's. You got that image? Go ahead and go to that image uh, for me, Joseph. It always helps. I'm a very visual person. For all you visual learners, there, there you go. Uh, especially stuff like this that's describing things in, in such a detail. So this beast I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Remember, the dragon is Satan. One of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? God, thank you for your precious word. First thing to note, no, notice that this, this, uh, this first beast here, it, in some ways, it, it, resembles, it resembles the dragon. It's got seven heads. Um, it's, got, uh, it's got ten horns. Uh, so it, it resembles this dragon, and the reason is, is because this beast mirrors the dragon. He's, he's, you could say he was, he, he's in the image of the dragon. You know, we were created in the image of God to reflect his, his goodness in the world. This beast is the image of, of the dragon. In fact, he's under the authority of this dragon, and it's given, uh, it's given authority by the dragon. So this beast has an authority, and it's given to uh, it by the dragon. Much like Jesus is under, uh, was under the authority of the Father and is given authority by the Father. This whole thing, Satan is all about mimicry. <laughs> it's counterfeit. Everything he does is, is counterfeit. It's, it, it, it's a fraud. And so is the beast and the dragon. And so this beast we see is actually uh, a lot of, Revelation, especially Revelation chapter 13, alludes a lot to the book of Daniel. And here we see especially Daniel uh, chapter 7. So I encourage you, you can go back and, and read up on some of that, and you'll see some, some similarities here. Here we see this, this beast that is, that is uh, in a way, it's like a bear and a in a way, it's like a, a, a leopard. In a, another way, it's, it's like a, a lion. When you go back to Daniel chapter 7, you'll see that this, is a, this beast is a mixture of the beasts of, of Daniel. We also find in Daniel that these, um, these beasts were kingdoms. They were actual kingdoms that were to come after the time of Daniel, uh, culminating in the, the Roman Empire. And so here we, we see this, this mega beast, right? It's this mega beast. It's, it's a combination of, of those other beasts. It's like, anybody ever grow up on Voltron? Yeah. Remember the different lions would come together and make a, 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 a mega robot? Yeah, I loved, uh, I loved me some Voltron. And uh, so that's sort of what's, 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 uh, what's going on here. Um, and so in, in the first century, this mega beast would have been would have been Rome. It was the greatest, up to that point, it was the greatest empire that, uh, ever, that ever existed. Um, this, uh, this beast, uh, this mega beast, it, it had a mortal wound that was healed. And, and this, this mortal wound, you'll notice, and it's in one of the heads. It's not the whole beast that had a mortal wound and was healed. One of its heads had a mortal wound, and it was, it was healed. And, and again, this is mimicry. This is fraudulent. This is mim- mimicking the resurrection. And so uh, going back to the, the, the first century, we'll start there. Some, some scholars uh, suggest that this referred to Nero's death. Uh, the Roman emperor Nero, he was a bad, bad dude. I mean, there's a lot of bad Roman emperors, but this guy was crazy. He was nuts. <laughs> there was, you know, the marbles weren't right upstairs, you know. Um, and it, very much also uh, satanically um, influenced, as I believe a lot of the emperors um, were. But uh, anyways, long story short, Nero, uh, after he, he persecutes the, the, the Christians, persecutes his own family, uh, does all kinds of, of uh, crazy stuff, he wreaks habits, he ends up committing suicide. He goes crazy and he ends up committing suicide. Others would say, no, this isn't, this, this isn't about Nero's death because they would argue that the Roman Empire 
well, even though it went through several emperors, like back to back to back, right after Nero, they would say it wasn't about to crumble. You know, it wasn't about to meet its death and then had a, 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 a resurrection. But there were, uh, there were a group of people after um, Nero committed suicide claiming that Nero had rose from the dead, that he was alive again. Something interesting to note. But I want remember, this whole Revelation series is about the big picture. I want us to get the big picture more than than speculation. We'll go into some of the speculation, and I've told y'all before, I'm not going into future speculation. I don't, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the whole, like, okay, this is, the, you know, Obama was the Antichrist, or, you know, this person who's coming, maybe this is the Antichrist, and the Lord's going to come back, and we can calculate it to this date, and stuff like that. Whatever happens in the future is still in the future. Just like uh, Old Testament, they knew an anointed one was coming, a, a king of the Jews, a Messiah. They didn't know how it was played out because they couldn't interpret the Scriptures in details when it comes to prophecy. Whatever the future holds is what the future holds. What we can look at is we can look at is what's happened in the past, and we can look at what God has for us now, right? And then we can hold an open hand and say, hey, let's see what God does in the future. So, big picture. This resurrection of this one, um, this mortal wound that was given to one of the beast's heads that, uh, that was healed. Um, the big p- picture is that what we see is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, remember Jesus looked like he was defeated, right, by the devil on the cross, and then three days later he's, he's, he's resurrected. He has the victory, right? And Satan is defeated, right? Satan is defeated uh, at that moment, but what happens after that? Even after Jesus ascends into heaven, evil still persists. I mean, even the Jews in the Old Testament, they were looking for a Messiah to come, and what they misunderstood about Jesus is there had to be a pit stop where sin was taken care of before the kingdom could be established. And in, we see in the Old Testament prophecies, a lot of those prophecies had first coming and second coming smushed together into one prophecy, right? So they didn't see this pit stop. <laughs> they failed to see that. And so they expected Him to come in and bring, bring in the kingdom and all of its righteousness and And that happened, but not in the way that they thought. So evil still seems to persist. The Roman Empire, they weren't rescued from their enemies. They're still under Roman rule after Jesus ascends into heaven. So there's this this, uh, mortal wound that seems to be healed, but it's fraudulent. Satan indeed is is defeated. So what what is this beast that we see? This beast that came out of the sea. I want to suggest that it's any human kingdom that sets itself up against God. In the first century, it's Rome. You've got to remember, these are seven real churches. You know, it helps throughout Revelation when we see these things to go back to those churches. And you'll see these themes that are being played out in symbols. You'll see those things in those letters to the seven, those seven churches when they're called to, uh, to persevere through the persecution and through the... Uh, um, the attempts to, uh, to lure them into uh, to idol worship. And so in the first century, uh, this, this beast is, is, is Rome. Later, you know, before the time of the Reformation, when the church became corrupt, it was, it was the church. In fact, in fact, a lot of the uh, reformers thought the Pope was the Antichrist. And they thought they were living in the time of the end. In World War II, it was Nazi Germany. It was uh, Stalin's regime. It's the Soviet Union. It's Al-Qaeda. It's North Korea. It's the list that goes on. Any kingdom of man that sets itself up against God is, is satanic. It's of the enemy. It's of the dragon. Even when the U.S. opposes God, we see the beast rising from the sea. Right? Our kingdom can follow after God. It can put itself under God. But when it becomes corrupt, you see that beast rising out of the sea. And so what's the activity of this first beast? Let's look, uh, starting in verse 5. We'll read by, verses 5 through 10 here. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming His name and His dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. 
Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name was not written... Now, if you have an ESV like me, it's actually, uh, it says before the foundation of the world, world in the Greek, that word is from. If you want to know why that's important, you can see me after church, I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you why that's important. But what you need to know right now is there is a Lamb's Book of Life uh, that has the name of God's people written in it. So everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world in the Book of Life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, this is a hymn here. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So what's going on here? The kingdoms of this world, they're allowed to have a way for a time. And so we see this theme uh, throughout Revelation. We've seen it in in Daniel of uh, three and a half years or 42 months or a a time, times a time, you know, or or half a week. It's said in all these different ways to to convey that for a period of a time, it's not eternal, it's not for a lasting time, for a period of a time. So the kingdoms of this world are allowed to have their way, right? That mortal wound that was healed, they're allowed to have their way for, for a time. We see in the first century, uh, the Roman Empire was a- opposed to Yahweh. It was opposed to God and His people. Many kingdoms today are still opposed to God and, a- and opposed to His people. In fact, I would say the world system as a whole. When we say we're not of this world, we don't mean we're not of this earth. The earth was made for human beings. It was made for mankind. When we say we're not of this world, we're not of this world's ways. We're not of this kingdom. We're not of this system that is opposed to God and His ways and His people. And so we see in this passage that a war uh, uh, is made against, against the saints, and we see a war against the saints in what? Every facet of life. Satan wants to see the worship of God cease. Did you know that? I mean, there is a spiritual uh, war going on, and he wants, although he's defeated, right? He wants to take as many people with him. He wants to stop the worship of God because he hates God, and he hates the Lamb. He hates, he hates Christ, and he'll do whatever it takes. And so in some parts of the world, we see uh, people who aren't able to, to, uh, to worship the one true God. We see people uh, set up against Christianity. We see people dying uh, for their faith, and it's very real for them. When they read Revelation, it comes to life for them because their lives are lived out much like these first century Christians. But we see it even in in a a, a democracy like like ours. (laughs) We see Satan trying to get a foothold. We see him trying to make his way in, and he's clever, and he wants to stop the worship of God. And so there's a line that we see that is is clearly drawn in in, in the sand here, and it's either God or the world, which is has it behind it the power of of the enemy. It's the lamb or the beast. That's that's what's going on here. That's the line in the sand. And so God has this book of life, and He knows who are His. He knows who belongs to Him. If you've called upon the name of the Lord, you are written in the Lamb's book of life. You are His. And there's this evil spiritual realm that is working against the child of God and hates the child of God. And you know what? The Bible doesn't hide this fact. It doesn't hide this reality, nor does it hide the reality of suffering, nor does it hide the reality of death. Why do I say that? Because we just read this this, uh, hymn or this poem that says, if anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Satan is is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, and people will die for their faith. People will suffer for their faith. I think that's so important for us Christians to understand. I mean, a lot of times we don't have context here. We see persecution here. But there may be a time where it's more than that for us. 
And we, we, we can't have, a, and I'm, I'm not saying we don't pray for protection. I'm not saying we can't pray for, for protection. But if that time comes for us, and you see people dying, if you don't have an eternal perspective, if you don't have a biblical perspective on things, what's going to happen? You're going to say, why God? And you're going to start blaming God. When He never promised these things. You were here to protect me, God. Why didn't you do that? He said, no, I'm here to nourish you. I'm here, I'm here to say that you're mine, and no matter, death cannot separate you from my love. And so that's what's going on here. Here is the call for the endurance and faith of the saints. That was the message to the seven churches. It wasn't like all hell's about to break loose and I'm going to protect you. You're going to be all right. It says, no, you're going to be all right because you have eternal life. And this life is, is the mission field. This life is the testing ground. This life is the wilderness. Trust me. Look to me. Again, I'm not saying we can't Pray for protection and that God won't protect us. There was many times that He protected uh, the apostles up until the time that it was their time to go. We don't know when our time is and we don't know uh, how God may step in, so I encourage you to, to pray for protection. But don't live your life in bubble wrap if it stops you from doing God's kingdom work. Make sense? Let's look at the second beast. Let's go to verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived, and was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both great and small, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. You know, we should have had a high attendance Sunday. This, we should have done one of those, you know, how some churches go out and invite everybody to bring them in. Because I believe this is the passage everybody is, is curious about in the whole Bible. Everybody, you know, is all the mark of the beast, and who's the beast, and who's the Antichrist? Well, you're here. This is, this is the day. <laughs> the second beast is deceptive. Yeah, it, notice it looks like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. You see, there's mimicry of, 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 of a Christ-likeness, but it speaks like, like a dragon because it's of Satan. It exercises the first beast's authority. So all the authority that was given to the first beast by the dragon, this one also have, has. And this beast, the second beast, actually draws people to worship the first beast. It has these signs uh, here that, that mimic uh, Elijah, but also it, it, it mimics the two witnesses. If you go back a, a couple chapters and you see the two witnesses, which we came to the conclusion that, um, well, maybe you didn't, but I did in my, in my studies, <laughs> that the, the, those two witnesses represent God's church bringing the gospel to the world. And so there's this mimicry of, of, of God's, God's people and the power behind the gospel, but remember, it's fraudulent. And this, this dragon and, the, and these, these two beasts, you see one coming out of the sea, one coming out of the land, they, they also mimic the true Godhead, Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. Satan is a fraud. This second beast is... is is the witnesses, right? We think of ourselves in terms of witnesses, the witnesses that were sent out by Christ. This second beast is the witnesses or the propagators of the first beast. 
That's what they do. They go out and they evangelize the first beast. Just like the apostles went out and evangelized Jesus Christ, they go out and they evangelize the first beast. It's the Roman emperor, whoever that might have been. At one time it was Nero, and then it was uh, Titus and so forth. It was, it's the Roman emperor who propagates Rome. It's Hitler. It's, it's, it's Osama bin Laden. It's Kim Jong-un. It's, but it's also it's, 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 it's Richard Dawkins. And I'm not saying that, hey, guys, I, what I don't want you to take away from this is that we hate our enemies. We love our enemies. We love our enemies, right? But right now, they represent the enemy, <laughs> especially those who are actively standing against Jesus Christ. So I feel safe to say it's Richard Dawkins. It's uh, Christopher Hitchinson. It's those people who are actively trying to evangelize people away from God to worship other kingdoms, other systems. And so these Roman emperors in the Roman Empire, they saw themselves as not just gods, they, uh, as the divine, they saw themselves as, as sons of God. In fact, the, the first emperor uh, during the time of, of, of Jesus, he came after Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar wasn't an actual emperor, but they looked at Ju Julius Caesar as divine, right? And so Augustus saw himself as the son of the divine, as the son of God. God's timing is awesome. Then there's a baby who is born in Bethlehem, the true Son of God. It's a mimicry. It's fraudulent. So these Roman emperors, they saw themselves as, as sons of, of God, and, and there were images. And go back to, uh, again, these seven letters, and you'll see uh, elements of this. There's images that were placed in various places within the... Uh, uh, empire. It's called the imperial cult, and they were called to show allegiance, just like in the book of Daniel, <laughs> when Daniel's friends were, were called to uh, worship the, uh, the image, and, and they, they, they refused to do so. And they were thrown in the furnace, and God preserved them. So there were images placed in various places throughout the empire, and they demanded allegiance. And these real human leaders, right? This wasn't just an idol. You see in the Old Testament, you see a lot of these, these idols that are made to these, to these false gods like Baal and, and so forth. Well, these were real human leaders that were demanding worship. And so these real human leaders, they're the reality. They bring life to these images. And these Roman emperors, they demanded worship and allegiance. That's why many Christians died for their faith, because they refused to do so. Then comes the mark of, of, of the beast. There's been a lot of speculation over this, this 666, 666, this, this uh, mark of, of the beast. In fact, uh, I grew up around a lot of speculation, microchips and all kinds of stuff. Uh, go to the first slide there, Joseph. Uh, for instance, did you know, interesting, you want, anybody like, um, uh, uh, not propaganda, what is it? Um, Conspiracy? Any conspiracy theorists here? Come on. Raise your hand. Anybody dab a little bit? Anybody conspiracy theorists at heart? Yeah. So you're going to love these two. You may already know them. Uh, Apple, the original Apple computer sold for $666.66. Yeah, it sold for $666. Notice also, although we don't know what was on, you know, on the tree, it doesn't say Apple in the, in the Bible. It says the fruit. But it's called Apple, and there's and the logo is a bite out of the apple, right? And this first computer is sold for 666. And now you got iPhones and all this I, 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 me, me, me. Yeah, for all you conspiracy theorists, there you go. Mark of the beast, right? Go to the next slide. All right, so this is the Hebrew alphabet, right? And in the Hebrew alphabet, every every letter represented a number. So it was also their, 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 their numbers as well. Look at the third one, the number six, 666. See that mark up there? See the, how the, the letter for uh, six is, is written there? All right, go to the next slide. Look at that, six, six, six. Look at the name of the energy drink, Monster. All you conspiracy theorists, there's stuff online Go at it. Have you know? Do do 
do what you do. Actually, look at the look at the monster. I'm I'm adding to this conspiracy here. Look at the the O on monster it has the cross with the thing around. Yeah. So um, there it is. The mark the mark of the beast. You keep drinking those things, and you're not going to have eternal life. I can tell you that. <laughs> You've received the mark of the beast. Now here's the thing. Did these guys do this on purpose? Maybe. Uh, um, Not Steve Jobs, I think it was his partner, uh, said he liked repeating numbers, and that's why he he chose to do that. They might have done it on purpose because they might get a kick out of it. I don't know. This one, yeah, I could see somebody, especially... Uh, somebody who's atheistic or, or definitely not a Christian doing something like this intentionally. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, is, if so, if it's intentional, I would say, yes, there's definitely evil behind it, even when people aren't intentional. You know, I've, I've heard stories of, like, anybody know the, the metal band in the 80s, uh, Slayer? My old pastor uh, told me he... he, he, he there was a reporter that followed them around, and his conclusion, his journalism was like, this band really isn't, like, satanic. It's, he says, but what they don't realize is it's out there in the audience. You know what I mean? And so I would say as, as a believer and very uh, understanding of the spiritual realm is what they're, what they're portraying is evil, even if they think it's a joke. Ozzy, a lot of his stuff was a joke. ACDC, a lot of, you know, the Hell's Bells, stuff like that, is because in the 70s and 80s, a lot of parents were going crazy about rock music being from the devil and stuff, and they played up on it to, to, to market and stuff. You know what I mean? So they weren't actually satanic, right? But they're playing people, and they're drawing people, you know, at least they were. Now a lot of people look through that kind of stuff. We've got other issues now. <laughs> kind of looks different now, but yes, there you go, iPhone. <laughs> so let's get back to the let's get back to the message. In Hebrew, you can go back to the to the um, there we go. In Hebrew, six hundred and sixty six uh, has been calculated. Remember, each of those letters represent a number. Uh, six hundred and sixty six has been calculated as Nero Caesar. Um, so if you calculate that, it, it can come out to, to Nero Caesar. Now, again, is that speculation like, you know, in the first century, like it was, you know, monsters or whatever? Uh, I think it's, it's quite possible, though we know with a lot of uh, conspiracy theory stuff, you can make stuff. I mean, we've seen it perfectly with the Bible and with Revelation. We can make things fit how we want. I mean, that's why you see these calculations of the end times and when Jesus is coming back and they never come to fruition, you know, we can, we can make things fit how we, how we want them to, to, to fit. And so, but I, 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 I think it's very possible that this number was, in one sense, meant to calculate uh, Nero Caesar. He's, he's a type of second beast. He's the type of this, this, uh, this second beast. In fact, I would say he's the archetype. He's not the only version of this, of this second beast. And so, again, go into the big picture. This number, 666, what you, uh, what you should observe is that it falls short of the divine number of completeness. Seven. Right? And then threefold. Threefold is a holy, holy, holy. Threefold is a big thing in Scripture. So you've got, you've got 666. It's a mockery. Not just a mockery, a mockery, but it falls short. That's what's being uh, conveyed. It, 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 it falls short of the divine Number. It's the number of a, of a man who, who, whose glory falls short of the glory of God. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in its end, it leads to death. The apostles said we must obey God rather than, than men. That was their conclusion when they were told to stop preaching the gospel. Uh, we, we see this mark, it's written where? It's written on the, the, the right hand and on the, the forehead here. And man, I, I grew up afraid that somehow I was going to be accidentally marked on the hand or the, the forehead or somebody's going to put chips, you know, or I don't know, yeah, microchip me or, or whatnot. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's go back to the law. Let's go back to the Old Testament. God tells His people Israel, uh, greatest commandment ever, right? To love Him with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to bind His commandments on where? On their arms and on their, their foreheads. What does that mean? In their thoughts and in their actions, right? I want you to love me. I want you to be devoted to me. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, I want you to love me. And I want you to, to bind this in your thoughts and, and in what you do and in your actions. That love for me should come through. Throughout Revelation, God's people, we see, are sealed with His name on their foreheads. It's mentioned like four or five times in the book of Revelation, the name of God written on the foreheads of His people. What is this seal? It's the Holy Spirit. It's not a, you know, none of us, I'm looking out here, unless you're all lost, and I don't see the name of God written on any of your foreheads, literally. But I do see a, a group of people that are children of God and that have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. That is the down payment, not only the empowering uh, 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 person of Jesus walking through us, but also you've been sealed. You've been given e eternal life. You belong to Him. That's ownership. He, you, he owns you. You belong to Him as His child. And that results in what? It should result when we, were, when we repent and we turn to God and He gives us a new heart that, 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 that changes our thoughts <laughs> towards God, towards, towards sin, and it changes our actions. 666 is, a, is, a, is mimicry. Again, I hate to be repetitive, but that's, that's the theme here. It's, it's fraudulent of that seal. It's, in, it's allegiance to any kingdom or system that opposes God. That's humanism, selfism, paganism, Buddhism, whatever you latch to that pushes Jesus out the door. And ultimately, it's, it's satanic. Again, I'm not encouraging us to go out and hate on the atheist and hate on the Buddhist. And that's not the message here. We want to win them. <laughs> as long as there's still breath in our bodies and as long as this world is still spinning around and Jesus hasn't returned for final judgment, we want to bring them into the kingdom. That's what we're, that's what we're called to do. The beautiful thing is in the U.S., we can still, we can still live freely without bearing... The mark of the beast. You're saying, whoa, what are, you what are you talking about? Without bearing the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast hasn't come yet. No, I'm, I'm here to suggest that, that the mark of the beast is, is currently present and it was present in, in John's day. And we're still free to function in this country without the mark of the beast, but many places in the first and second century, the Christians weren't allowed to function. <laughs> they met persecution. They met they met, met death. Many places in the world, you can't function freely if you don't have the mark of the beast, if you serve the true God of heaven. And tomorrow, that could change for us as well. So in conclusion, these, these monsters are real. And so the question becomes, how do we avoid them leaving their mark on us. And I would, I, would, I would say that if we're looking at soda cans and microchips, that we may be missing the point. And I'm not, I'm not here to say, again, I hold future stuff in an open hand. You know, I hold that with an open hand. I'm not, going, I'm not here to say that there might be some kind of literal mark, but I don't think that's what's being conveyed here. How do we avoid them leaving their mark on us? 1 John 4. It's amazing. I was looking for one verse this morning, and it alludes to something much greater. 1 John 4, John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets, that's the second beast, guys, many false prophets have gone into the world. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. That doesn't just mean he's, you know, that, he's, that he's human, but that's a big part of it, and especially in John's day, there were those that were 
uh, had this, this cultish Jesus, uh, uh, the, the, the Gnostics, that he did not come in the flesh. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ in all that it entails. We can say that, right? Every spirit that, that confesses that Jesus Christ has, has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. What does it say next? This is the spirit of Antichrist. That's the dragon and the two beasts. This is the spirit of Antichrist. The dragon is behind the spirit of Antichrist in the world. Satan is behind it. This is the spirit of Antichrist which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. So in John's time, yeah, all hell was about to break loose. If you want to still look into the future. But it has come. You know, John is saying it's already come. Satan is already mad because his ant pile has been stepped on. It's coming and is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. This is how we avoid the mark of the beast. For he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. So we have the seal of God. Do you have the seal of God this morning? Do you have the mark of God? You have the mark of the Lamb. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. Now the dragon gives them power, right? And, and, and the purpose of the second beast is to bring about worship of the first beast, which is under the authority of, of the dragon. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. But we are from God. And Paul says, because he's an apostle, whoever knows God listens to us because they speak the truth. They're speaking the truth of God. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the question becomes, as we close this morning, is who do you listen to? Who do you listen to? Who is, who is your master? How do we avoid the, 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 the mark of the beast? By receiving the mark of, of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to make a bold statement. If you have not received the mark of, of, uh, of the Lamb, of, of Jesus Christ, I'm going to make a bold statement and say that you are currently bearing the mark of, of the beast. You're, 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 you're a slave... Uh, to this world. You're a slave to sin. Ultimately, I'm not calling you the devil, but you're a slave to the enemy because he's, like I said last week, I think Tam laughed when I said this, he's playing you. Satan has got you on, on strings like a, like a puppet. And you know what God wants to do? He wants to cut those strings and set you free <laughs> so that you can freely follow him. Let me tell you, if you do not have the mark of Christ, you have a veil over your eyes. And my hope is that preaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit is coming and He is removing that veil for, to give you eyes to see because He wants to draw you into His kingdom. But you know what you have to do? You have to surrender to Him. You have to repent. You know what repent means? It doesn't mean get around and turn in your chair and, 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 and bow down, though it, it could look like that. It doesn't mean tears rolling down your eyes, but that could be a fruit of it. Often, sometimes it is. It means changing your mind about who God is and who Jesus is and who your allegiance is to. You say, I am not following after the world. I am not following after the enemy. I'm not following after the devil. I, I'm going to follow after God. I'm going to have a new way. And you know, when you do that, because you can't do it on your own, God empowers you to do so. He makes you a new creation. He deposits His seal, His Holy Spirit within you and makes you a new person. But guys, you've got to surrender have you done that? Have you done that? Have you surrendered? Have you given your life fully to Jesus? Christians, greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. Satan has no hold on us. We're free. What are you allowing yourselves to be bound to? And I'm not, I'm not here to say, listen to this music, not this music, you know, watch this movie, don't watch this movie. It's not about that. You're allowing God to constantly search your heart. 
and reveal those idols in your life. Right? Because those idols are from the beast. It's from a worldly system that is satanic and wants to draw you away from, from God. Guys, we, we bear the mark of Jesus Christ. We bear the mark of the Lamb. Greater is he that is in us than he who's in the world. We have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. But I want to say this, and then I'll stop. We have nothing to fear, but we need to be attentive. We can't walk through this life like zombies just going through the motion because we've been called from dead to life. Do you have eyes to see? Let us pray. The worship team is going to come up. If you'd like to uh, pray with me, I would love to pray with you.